All right, David Brooks, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back with you. So last time we had you on was a few years ago to discuss your book, The Road to Character. You got a new book out, The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. Is this book a continuation of your thoughts that you fleshed out in The Road to Character, or is it something different? It's a bit of a correcting what went wrong with that one, or what are the limitations of that one. And so both books are sort of about how do we become better people. And when I wrote that, I wrote it about some amazing people. We still have a lot to learn from people like Dwight Eisenhower and George Marshall and Samuel Johnson and Dorothy Day. And so I don't renounce that other book. But when I was thinking about how people built their character, I think I was still stuck in an individualistic mindset. And so to me, you like the way you build characters, you, you identify your core sin, like you might have anger if you're Dwight Eisenhower, and then you work on it every day. And so character building is about inner conflict. And I think there's some bit of character building is about that. It's like you go to the gym, you work up your honesty muscle, your courage muscle, you get stronger at those things. The problem is, I don't think most of us have the willpower to do that. And so the question is, how do we really develop the willpower to become better people? And I think we do that by falling in love with something. So for example, when my first kid was born, we didn't know he had really low APGAR score. We didn't know whether he'd live or die that first night. And I remember thinking, would it be worth it for his mom and I to have a lifetime of grief for him to live just 30 minutes. And if you'd asked me that before he was born, I would have said, no way. What, you know, why should two people suffer a lifetime of suffering for 30 minutes of a creature who doesn't even know he exists. But after the kid was born, I became aware of a level of commitment and love that I didn't even imagine existed beforehand. And when you become aware of that level of commitment and love, you want to make promises to the kid. I'll always be there for him. And you start start behaving a little less selfishly than you would have before. Like you might want to go out and play golf, but instead you care for the kid, push him around in the baby carriage, and you start doing things for other people. And over time, I think you get a little less selfish. And so now I think character formation is really about keeping up with our commitments. We fall in love with something, we make a promise to it, and then we try to live up to the promises we make. So it's much more relationship-centered and less individualistic. And did you have any experiences, or was this you know, just talking with people after you wrote The Road to Character, where you kind of realized that character formation is about relationships and about commitments, and not just sort of this sort of Nietzschean, you know, will-to-power, Ubermensch mission? Yeah, I mean, you get some stuff in books, but you, you only get a little. Like, books name things that you experienced. Somebody once said you can be knowledge, knowledgeable with other men's knowledge, but you can't be wise with other men's wisdom. And you sort of have to go through stuff. And I went through a period just at the time I was finishing Road to Character, but I didn't really put it in the book because I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I just went through a bad period of life. And we all go through periods in the valley, and some are not our fault. Like a couple of years ago, my mother died, and that was a bad period in the valley. But some kind of are my fault. And in 2013, I went through one that was at least partially my fault. And My marriage had ended and my kids were going away to college. And I lost a lot of the friends that I used to have in the more in the conservative movement. And I realized I had weekday friends, like the kinds I could talk to about work, but I didn't have that many weekend friends. And I'd sort of gotten to a place where week where work and all the amount of work I did had sort of numbed over both the the heart, the desire for connection with another, and the soul, the desire of connection to be good. And so there'd been sort of a a moral numbing and a relational numbing. And so I was down in the valley for a year or two and learned a few things down there. So this idea of valley, this goes back to this metaphor that structures the book. You make the case that there are, life consists of two mountains. What's the first mountain like? And then let's talk about the second mountain after that. Yeah, the first mountain is the mountain society wants us to climb. You get out of school and you want to have a good career. You want people to think well of you. And you want to carve out an identity and make a mark in the world. And this, this is what our meritocracy tells us to want. To, you know, if I make enough money, if I have a good career, people will think well of me and I'll be happy. And I think that's a lie. I think there are certain lies embedded in our meritocracy. One is that career success leads to fulfillment. I can guarantee you that's not true for most people. Uh, the second is I can make myself happy. That happiness is an individual achievement if I just lose a few more pounds or get better at golf or something. But if you talk to people on their deathbed, they say, you know, I was happiest when I was least self-sufficient, when I was most dependent on others. And that's a living in relationship. And then there are a bunch of other lies that you're not a soul to be saved, you're a set of skills to be maximized. And the most pernicious lie of our culture is 
that people who have achieved a lot more and are a little smarter are somehow worth more than other people. And so you, you fall for all these lies and um, they sort of lead you in the wrong direction and they lead you thinking too much about the desires of the ego, which are pretty simple desires, but bad and not enough about the desires of the heart and the desires of the soul. So you, down in the valley, you sort of discover your better desires and try to align yourself with them. So this basically it's created, we have a culture of individualism. I mean, how did we, how did we get these assumptions in the West that individualism will bring happiness? What's the history of that? The social his, history of that? Yeah. Well, we've always been individualistic, like the Tocqueville talked about in the 1830s, but we've always had another ethos, which balanced that. And sometimes that ethos was religion, which was more about community and more about service to some good. Sometimes it was just like bohemianism, that you served art. There were a lot of different things that balanced it. And in the 1950s, say, we had a, a real belief in hanging together. We had to get through the war. We had to get through, before that, the Great Depression. And so there was a culture of, we're all in this together. And if you grew up, say, in Chicago, you didn't say, I'm from Chicago. You said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski. Because it was your little neighborhood that really defined your life. And that had some wonderful elements, really strong communities, but it became stifling to people. And, and people thought, I'm just a soulless cog in this conformist society. And so they rebelled in the 60s, and they said, I want to be free to be myself. And some of that started in the early 60s and some in the late 60s, the Woodstock. But it was symbolized by a moment very early in my childhood. The first football game I really paid attention to was Super Bowl three, And on one side of the field was a guy named Johnny Unitas from the Baltimore Colts. And he was like a 1950s guy, very conformist, crew cuts, very unflashy. And on the other side of the field, there was a guy named Joe Namath for the New York Jets. And he was very flashy, long hair, $5,000 for coats. He wrote a memoir called, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. And that was the culture of let's rebel. Let's be expressive, not reticent. It's cooler to be young, not old. And so we created a much more individualistic culture. I'm free to be myself. And that had a right-wing version, which was the economic individualism of the 1980s. It had a left-wing version, which was the lifestyle individualism of the 60s and 70s. And so, But it was all individualism. And when you have a culture really built, built on the self, self-satisfaction, self-sufficiency, self-happiness, you end up weakening the bonds between people. And that's more or less what we've done. And, and how is that manifesting itself in our culture today? What are you seeing? Like the, 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 down, the downsides of it, yeah? Yeah, we don't just have as good connections as we do. And so if you ask people a generation ago, people entertain in their homes an average about 16 times a year. Now it's down to eight. Only 8% of Americans say they have uh, important conversations with their neighbors. In if you ask people over 45, 35% of people over 45 say they're chronically lonely. If you look at the suicide rate, which is really a proxy for loneliness, it's up 30% in the last 20 years. If you look at the teenage suicide rate, it's up 70% in the last eight years. And if you ask people, do you trust your neighbors? A generation ago, 60% of Americans said they, my neighbors are basically trustworthy. Now only 32% say that and 19% of millennials. So we've become a much lonelier culture, much more distrustful culture, and a culture that's much nastier or nastier to each other. Right. You talk about the, also in the book, the rise of tribalism we're seeing in our political discourse. Yeah, tribalism seems like community because it is a way of bonding with others. But to me, it's the dark side of community. It's, it's not based on mutual affection for a town or something. It's based on mutual hatred of some other. And so it's a scarcity mentality. It's a zero-sum mentality. It's always about fighting, distrust, and war. And that's pretty much defines our politics and a lot else. And do you think social media and the internet has amplified all these these downsides? I do. I mean, I think when you're, we're on social media, we're not really communicating out of our depths. We're either on Twitter, which is a lot of people saying I'm smarter than you are, or sometimes on Instagram, which is a lot of people saying I'm more fabulous than you are. And it's just a shallow form of communication. It's not a deep form of communication. And I think if you look at that teenage suicide rate increase, a lot of that has to be tied to the smartphone. Phone. It just correlates so perfectly with that. And not only just the actual technology, but the fact that it creates this mentality of I'm manipulating you to get a response. I'm competing to, to get a better response. And so it's just a, a shallow form of communication. I think the good news is we're trying to, I think we are figuring it out. Like we all know the upside of the social media and the technology, 
And I think people are now experimenting and trying to find ways where they can get rid of the downside by limiting the time they spend on their phones or limiting what they do on their phones or trying to turn the thing off one day a month. I have a friend who he gets up and before he looks at any screen, he goes outside and just looks at the sky for a few minutes and has a few thoughts. It's just a way of getting things in the right order. But what's interesting, you when I talk to people or whenever you know newspapers interview young people, you can tell there's like this desire for meaning and significance. But then you see how people look for that. It seems like they go about it at like trying to find meaning and significance using that first mountain response, right? They don't actually go to the second mountain. They figure, well, I can just work really hard to find meaning. And that doesn't work. Right. Like it's a homework assignment. Yeah. No, because that's the language. If we're raised, you know, you start at 15 or 16 and you get put in the college admissions process. And so you're raised in an ethos of, well, I have to earn it. It's all about, you know, work, doing my homework, uh, working out. And then the thing that's, I think, most treacherous, or at least most treacherous for me, is you get this productivity mindset. And so much of our day is taken up by email and stuff like that. So your the little clock in your head says, on to the next project, on to the next project. And so you never actually sit down and have time for real relationships, which do take incredible patience and time. And I found in my worst, I, I value productivity over people, which is an illusion. But I would say among my students, I teach college, you know, they, they say we're so hungry, like they're very open that we are so hungry for some sort of spiritual nourishment, but we're not sure we have the vocabulary. We're not sure we've been given the path. And I do think that's the fault of my generation. Frankly, we haven't passed along how to do the hard things, like have good character, have good relationships. And often on the most important subjects of life, we really don't know what to say. Well, you mentioned the valley that you went through to get on to the second mountain. Does everyone have to go through that valley, like a dark time in their life when they realize that they're, they, were, they weren't on the, necessarily on the wrong mountain, but it's, like it's, not, it's not all the mountains of life? Yeah, I, I don't think they have to. I know a lot of people, my wife included, who she started on her second mountain. Like The second mountain, the first mountain is, is, is about building up your ego and acquiring things. The second mountain is about contributing things and giving things back. First mountain, you're just trying to earn a good reputation. The second mountain, you're just trying to pour forth and you get joy from the happiness you bring to others. And a lot of people are just good somehow just all the way through there. They, they were born in an environment and in a family that emphasized the right values, uh, that put relationship before self. And they are lucky ones to grow up in a, in a nurturing family, nurturing culture. But I will say, I don't know anybody in life who hasn't gone through hard times of one sort or another. And I was with a 94-year-old guy not too long ago who said, you know, when I look back on my life, I realize I'm, my whole life is defined by how I reacted to my moments of adversity. And I, I do think that's true. And you, you ask people, you know, what made you? If I ask you, what, what was the event that really made you who you are? Most people point to a moment of struggle and how they reacted to it. So I would point to my vow. I would point to two things. And one is good and one is bad. Now that I think about it, I went to a great summer camp from age five to age 23 with the same group of people every summer for two months. And that was a great relationship because it, it surrounded me in, in friendships, uh, friendships I still have today. And so that was, that was one thing that made me who I am and gave me a, a viewpoint. And then the second was this valley I went through in 2013. And that was a hard thing I had to get through. Yeah, and you give the examples of different valleys people can go through. It could be a divorce, it could be a sickness, it could be a job loss, but it could also be, you know, your first mountain life is great, everything's on lockdown, but you just feel that existential angst or that soul sickness that you think there's something more, and then it knocks you off, and then you you find that second mountain. Yeah, there's a great concept that was popular in the Middle Ages, but we sort of don't talk about it today, even though it's very common, called acedia, and that's the loss of desire. And some people like they were just climbing and they were hungry to get to the top. And then somehow it, they just can't care anymore. They just, the passion is gone. And then they're sleepwalking. I had a friend who was um, being interviewed for a job and he turned around at the end and asked the interviewer a question. And the question was, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And the woman burst out crying because if she wasn't afraid, she wouldn't be doing HR at that company, but she doesn't know what to do with her life. And so she's just trudging through a life she doesn't actually enjoy. That doesn't arouse her high desires. And I think there are people like that, and there are people who, who you know, feel, I don't quite know what to do. I'm kind of stuck here. 
And that's a version of a valley. In other valleys, you know, everything's going well, but you get hit by something that wasn't part of the original plan. You know, you, you get a cancer scare, you lose a loved one. And when you're in suffering over grief or something like that, the desires of the first mountain, the desires of the ego, they just don't seem that important anymore. And you have trouble mo- mobilizing your whole life around them. So you argue the second mountain is all about commitment. It's, it's, it's the committed life. And this goes contrary to what our individual culture tells us will bring us happiness. So how does, how does binding ourselves through commitments give life meaning and bring us joy? Yeah, it's really uh, the two mountain metaphor is really, a, is really about two different value systems. And one value system is the individualistic one. And the second one is the one where you, we make promises to each other. And so in my view, we're not going to go back to the 1950s. You know, I defer to the organization. I defer to authority. We're not going back to that culture. But we could build a culture around commitment making, that our life is really defined by the commitments we make. And so most of us make commitments to uh, several of four things, or maybe all four things, to a spouse and family, to a community, to a vocation, and to a philosophy or faith. And my argument is that the fulfillment of our lives depends on how well we make and choose those commitments. So a lot of the book is just asking basic questions like, how do you choose a marriage partner? How do you figure out who to marry? And then once you've married them, how do you figure out how to behave? So you make the marriage a full marriage. Or how do you choose your vocation? How do you know what job is the right life-fulfilling career for you? And that, things like that. How do, you, how do you come to faith? How do you find a philosophy? How do you serve your town? And so these are all very just practical questions of how you lead life that's about really a committed, a really buried life where you've, you've, you've chained yourself down to something you really care about and you dedicate yourself to that thing year after year. And what's interesting, as you highlight in the book, as you commit yourself to something bigger than yourself, you can actually, that's how you find yourself. I think oftentimes in America, we think, well, I'm going to go off into, I'm going to drive in a van, sleep in a van. I'm going to find myself that way. But really, no, it's, it's submitting yourself to something larger is how you can develop an identity. Yeah, and everybody says you should serve a cause larger than yourself, but the cliche is always around. But nobody tells you exactly how. And you got to realize you have to chain yourself down. And so there are two, um, two definitions of freedom that are out in the world. One is freedom as absence of restraint. I can do whatever I want. And then freedom as freedom of capacity. I, to have the freedom to play piano, you have to chain yourself down and practice. So you can really play. And a lot of your life is determined by what sort of definition of freedom you have unconsciously in your head. And so, you know, I, I'm a writer, so I pay attention to how other writers work. And one of the things they do is they tend to have very rigid routines. They get up at nine. I think it was Toni Morrison used to go to a hotel room. She kept and in the hotel room. There were only four things. There was a typewriter, a Bible, a desk, and a bottle of brandy. And she just locked herself in the room and wrote all morning. And that commitment to writing seemed like a restraint, and it was a restraint, but it really set her free to to do what she was meant to do. Well, let's talk about some of the commitments you talk about in the book. Uh, The first one's vocation. I think we've all heard that word before, but I think we often confuse our careers for vocation. Or in other words, we call our career our vocation, but that's not, our career is not necessarily a vocation. Yeah, a career is something you, you look at the skills you have. And you look in the marketplace and you say, well, how can I get the most return on my skills? And so I'm good at math. Somebody needs to do accounting, so I'm going to become an accountant. And so that's a career. And it doesn't really involve your heart and soul necessarily. It's how you trade your skills for money. But some people are called. In a a vocation, You're not. it's not like a choice. You're called. And you find something incredibly beautiful. I read about this guy, E.O. Wilson. When he was seven, he was out in the beach for the first time in his life, he got to see the ocean and he saw jellyfish and animals he'd never imagined. He saw stingrays and he was called by the beauty, like was entranced by the, what he found. And his whole life has been about becoming a naturalist, read an interview with a painter and she was asked, why'd you become a painter? And she said, I just love the smell of paint. My daughter, when she was five, she went into an ice hockey rink. She just felt at home at a rink. And now she teaches hockey in California. And so it's more a sense that there's some beauty out there that calls you to do what you were meant to do in your life. And it could be accounting. I mean, it could be, I know a guy, he just, he finds beauty in spreadsheets 
just in the mathematical elegance of the numbers being in the right place. But it's it's not really a choice. It's more submitting to something outside you that just seems entrancingly beautiful. And your your calling might not necessarily be the way you make your living. You might have a day job, but then in the afternoon or the evening, you you work on your calling. Yeah, there's a great quote in the book that says, sometimes I've been paid for my work, and sometimes I haven't been paid for my work, but I'm always doing my work. And I think that's a nice distinction. You know, I, I know some people who are, they're just great at hospitality. And sometimes they might do that as a job in, say, the hotel business. But oftentimes they do it by organizing barbecues. And I have a friend who says that she's aggressive. She's an aggressive friend. She's aggressively friendly. And that means she's in the friend group. She's the one organizing everything. She's the one putting together the giving circle or putting together the re- regular dinners that people have. And she just gets great pleasure from cooking and hosting people. And you can do that as a career or you can do that just for fun, but it's still your vocation. And if you ask somebody like, who are you right down? Who are you at, you know, if I, what, what's your identity? You know, I, part of my identity is being a writer and sometimes I get paid for it. Sometimes I don't, but it's what I am. Right. And I guess the way you, you figure this out is, you know, it, like you feel it like, you know, like EO Wilson, like you just feel entranced by the animals, like look for that thing. And that's going to lead you to what your vocation possibly is. Yeah. Nietzsche said, write down the four most beautiful moments of your life and then see if you can draw a thematic line through them. And that's how you discover that what he called the law of your very nature. And so sometimes you get to the point of the double negative. It's like, I can't not do this. This is who I am. I'm a teacher. Like if you get called, you know, often we stumble into the things we do because something happens to us. And sometimes it's a very bad thing. Like, you know, that we're in a town and I know a woman, she was a healthcare executive in New Orleans and she got shot in the face by two boys, 10 and 11 years old, who had to shoot somebody to be as part of their gang initiation ritual. And she remembers she recovered and she remembers look the look on their face just before they shot her. And it was a look of pure terror. And she realized they were really terrified too. They were, they were put in a situation where to be in a gang and have friends, they had to go shoot some random person. And she said, well, I was collateral damage, but they're the real victims. And so she realized at that moment, her calling was to deal with boys and girls who were in gangs. And so she quit her job as a healthcare executive and now works with gang members and works for the city of New Orleans. And sometimes you just called by bad circumstances, but you get to the point where you say, I can't not do this, I'm, so I'm going to do it. I think you talk about Victor Frankl asking that question, like, what's my responsibility here? Like, what is, what is life asking me to do right now? Yeah, and in commencements, we give a lot of garbage advice. And one of the pieces of garbage advice we give is, you should ask, what do I want from life? That's too vague a question. You, you never come up with an answer. The better question, Frankl says, is what is life asking of me? So what's the big problem that my generation or I am called to deal with? And what problem I, am I uniquely suited to deal with? And I gave a commencement this year and I said, listen, if you're graduating from college now, the big problem your, your generation faces is the, the social fragmentation, the political division, the lack of connection. So some generations are called to uh, fight wars or battle depressions, but your generation is called to build really strong relationships with one another. And that's a pretty good calling. That's a pretty good responsibility to have. That's, it's hard to do, but it's, it's better than some of the alternatives that earlier generations are called to have. Uh, so the next commitment is marriage. And it's not just marriage. You say we need to commit ourselves to maximum marriage. What do you mean by maximum marriage? Yeah, there's a style of marriage that's out that's prevalent today that what sociologist Eli Frankel calls it's sort of a minimal marriage, the self-expressive marriage. That's two people. We we care for each other and we both have our indiv- indiv- individual projects in life that we're going to do. And we're going to get married and we're going to help each other on our individual projects from time to time. But our life is still mostly about the individual projects. And I'm not sure marriage can survive that. I think marriage is tough and you have to be all in. Tim Keller is a pastor in New York says, when you're in marriage, you get into marriage and about two years in, you realize that the person you married who you thought was completely perfect and completely wonderful is actually kind of selfish. And as you're making this realization about her, she's making it about you. And so you have a decision to make. You can either have a truce marriage, in which case you won't talk about each other's flaws, and you'll just have a kind of superficial marriage. 
or you can decide you're going to deal with the flaws, but you're going to realize that, you know, she seems kind of selfish, but actually my own selfishness is the core problem here. I'm going to be alert to my own selfishness. It's my own selfishness is the only selfishness I can control. And Keller says when you have two people who see their own selfishness as the core problem in the marriage and who are working on it, then you have the makings of a great marriage. But that requires you like to totally throw yourself into it to defeat the ego to serve the marriage. And that's a tough thing to do, but that is the essential moral challenge of marriage. And do you have any, based on your research and your writing and talking to people, any advice for people who aren't married but want to get married to find that kind of marriage partner who also wants a maximum marriage? Uh, Yeah, the first thing I always tell my students is marriage is a 50-year conversation, so you have to be able to talk to the person forever. (laughs) And so you better have very pure communication. It should be the sort of person that you just love talking to on the phone for hour upon hour. But then the, there's obviously been a ton of research on how to make this decision, and it falls into three buckets. The first is the psychological bucket. What traits does the other person have? And the, the shorthand answer is go for kindness and avoid neuroticism. And kindness doesn't seem particularly exciting. Sometimes we're attracted to the bad boys or the bad girls, but it's really useful in a marriage. And neurotics, people are making drama out of everything. The research suggests those people never change. They never stop making drama. So kindness is really valuable. Then there's the passion lens, which is what kind of love do you have for this person? And the Greeks used to say there are three different kinds of loves. There's philia, which is friendship. There's eros, which is real passion, lust, and that kind of thing. And then there's agape, the desire to give your selfless love away to the person. If you just have philia and maybe some lust, then you have a relationship, but you don't have a marriage. If you just have agape, you really want to give yourself to this person, but you don't have lust, then you you just have sort of admiration. It's best to have all three kinds of loves. And then the final lens is the moral lens, which is, you know, love is going to come and go, but admiration is pretty stable. And do you admire the person? Do they do things that you find morally admirable? A marriage can survive a lot of things, but one thing it cannot survive is disrespect and contempt. So pick someone you really admire. And then the one other good piece of advice I was given was, you know, when we think about getting marrying someone, we ask a lot of questions about the other person. Are they the right person? We don't ask enough questions about ourselves, which is really, am I ready for this? Am I ready to lead a very different kind of life? Because until you get married, you can live with the illusion that you're easy to live with. But when you get married, somebody is watching you and you become aware of exactly all the ways you're crazy and selfish. And that, so you got to be willing to be changed. And I imagine as if you've been married for a while, being, keeping that idea or being willing to change, keeping that up will help strengthen your marriage as the years go on. Yeah. Some of it is just like practical stuff. Like I, I pass along in the book, I take a lot of the best bits of advice I've read from others and I just pass them along. And one of the things I read was like, sometimes when you're in a relationship, they say never go to bed mad, but sometimes you're just tired. So you just go to bed and that's, you know, go to bed tomorrow. You'll wake, make waffles together. Things will seem better. Another bit of advice I got for women in marriage was just, if you feel the urge to bitch about him to somebody, bitch to his mom and not to yours because his mom will forgive him, but yours never will. And so these are just like little practical things. And Commitments are lived out every day. And so there, there's just got to be practically committed to, not just, it's not just theory. So the third commitment is to philosophy and faith. And you make the case that reading the great books of Western civilization or just studying Western civilization can be a way to commit yourself to the intellectual life. How so? And how, how, can, it, how can that transform you? Yeah. So I happened to go to college where they taught the great books. It was the University of Chicago. And so we read like, Tolstoy and Aristotle and Plato. And the thing about the geniuses of those times is in some ways they're very different, but in some ways they know us better than we know ourselves. And so they really broke things down. How do you become a virtuous person? How do you do forgiveness? How do you experience grace? Or even like George Eliot or Jane Austen, like how do you think through the marriage decision? Uh, George Eliot wrote a lot about that. And so they are very practical advice. And then they also, they, they touch you on a level that's deeper than, you know, I read for the newspaper book. Newspapers don't really touch you on the level of your soul or your heart. But if you hear 
you know, Mozart's, you know, if you hear Ode to Joy, if you see Chart Cathedral, if you've read, you know, Tolstoy, you've been touched on a much deeper level. And I think one of the things they do is they educate the emotions. And so we all have some crude emotions, but when you've touched, been touched by art, your emotions get much more refined. Now, here's one trivial example. I once saw Taylor Swift interviewed on 60 Minutes, and the interviewer said, you know, you write a lot of sad songs. And she said, well, actually, there are about 17 different kinds of sadness. And she said, there's your boyfriend rakes up with you sadness, and she played a little tune. Your mom is mad at you sadness. She played another tune. You've lost your dog sadness. She played another. And she is an expert on sadness. And if you go through life, you want to go through life with a lot of different a repertoire of emotions so you can feel the right kind of sadness and a different kind of sadness, and you can understand your own feelings a little better. And that's what I think happens with the great books. And you can do this together with other people. I mean, one of the most significant things, you know, meaningful things I've done in my life in the past few years is a, we have a, a men's group here in town in Tulsa where we've been reading the great books. And, you know, you started at the Iliad, we're at Shakespeare now. And it's been great meeting with these guys once a month to, to discuss these ideas. Yeah, one of the phrases I pass along is, there's no such thing as thinking for yourself. Like even the language we think in is a creation of the group. And when you get together and, and just debate these issues, that to me is one of the great pleasures of life. And just having, just you're in the moment and you each are building on each other's thoughts. That's one of the great gifts of friendship. And I'm in a group like that and uh, we're sort of sensitive that nobody should talk too much. And a lot of the book is, a lot of my book is just things we discuss together as as a group of guys reading a bunch of books that have made us a little less shallow than we otherwise would be. Let's talk about the commitment to faith and religion, because that's a hard sell in a culture that's becoming increasingly secular. I think the number of people who describe themselves as none when it comes to religious affiliations, the highest it's ever been. Um, how, are, how are you defining spirituality in this book? Are you advocating for something like, you know, that spiritual but not religious, or are you talking about religion yeah. as well? I'm lean toward religion. I get being a nun since I spent most of my life as a nun, not believing in, in God, even though I was around a lot of organized religions. But I guess, at least for me, over time, my categories, which were pretty atheistic, became inadequate to reality as I experienced it. And so there were just moments of time that seemed um, mystical, that seemed like there was a presence of, that couldn't be explained by just material causes. And often that presence was in other people, like I'm a journalist, like other, other people's lives. And I just couldn't care about the stories I write about if, if people were just sacks of genetic material or being blown around by evolutionary forces. I, I see them as creatures with souls that have something in them that is of infinite value and dignity, something in them that gives them moral responsibility to either behave well or behave badly. And so I said, you know, the people I write about have souls. And we all have souls. And you don't even have to believe in God to believe that there's some invisible piece of yourself that has no size, weight, color, or weight, but that gives you infinite value and dignity, that slavery is wrong because it cuts over another person's soul, and that the soul yearns to lead a good life, which I think we all want to lead a good life. We all want to lead a meaningful, purposeful life. And so once you get that sense that other people have souls, and at every second of every day, their souls are either getting a little more holy or a little more degraded, their souls are getting sick, their souls are yearning, then it's a short step, or at least it was for me, to a belief, well, maybe the material world is not the only world, that there's, there's something else as well. And so in the book, I just try to describe a very boring, gradual process toward faith. And what does that commitment to faith look like, for you at least? Well, if partly it's, it's faith is change. As one of the writers I quote says, it's not like, you know, some people, when they talk about God, they say, you know, I prayed and God told me to move to, to Arizona instead of Nevada. And I respect people who feel they have that contact with God. I can't tell you I've ever felt it that specifically to me. It's, it's seeking the beauty of certain things. Like uh, there are certain stories in the Bible that are just morally very beautiful. And I'd like to have, opinion my life more on the beauty that are in some of these stories rather than the ugliness that's in the world. And so I have a sense of what grace is. I just, uh, this joyous love that you can't earn. And I'd rather pin my life toward that than pin it toward, you know, 
going to the casino and hitting the jackpot. And I, I don't know, it's, a, it's an aesthetic sense of what is truly morally beautiful. And I make a distinction in the book between happiness and joy. And happiness happens when you get a promotion, your team wins the Super Bowl. It's the expansion of self. Joy happens when the barrier between you and something you really care about disappears. And so there's joy when you're with your kids and you're just playing. Sometimes there's joy in work where you totally lose yourself in your work and you experience flow. Sometimes there's joy with someone you love and you're just so delirious to be together. Sometimes there's joy in nature. You you feel part of the natural surroundings. You become one with the forest as you're hiking through it. And the, one of the messages in the book is happiness is good, but joy is better. And the ultimate joy is, is transcendent joy the, when you've surrendered yourself to some pure good and you, you're not even thinking about yourself anymore. You're doing something just because you think it is morally beautiful. Yeah, and I, I imagine the faith you're talking about too, it, it, the examples you gave, it, all, it was all about leading back to other people. Right. It's not even the faith you're talking about is not sort of this, you know, uh, personal salvation. It's like it's a faith that leads me towards action that transcends myself and wants me to love others and, you know, love my group, love my family, whatever that is. Yeah. I had a, I had a camp counselor who then became a friend who was an Episcopal priest. And he was just like a, a holy child almost. Even he, he lived till about 60. And he saw some really hard things. He he worked in Honduras among the poor. He worked with women who suffered domestic violence. But he spoke in this enthusiastic. He had all, he would always interrupt his sentences with whistles and pops and laughs. And he just didn't think about himself. He was just grateful for every person he met, and he treated every person he met as sort of a miracle. And so he really did live a life of selfless love. And I run into such people who are just glow with joy maybe once a month or so I get to work. I, I've got this project at the Aspen Institute and I get to work with Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist. And that guy is just happy all the time. And he just delights in his work. He delights in the people he meets. He's filled with gratitude. And, you know, he's got as much fame and money as he could ever handle. And so he, he's going around the world playing in order to bring angry people together and out of anger. And it's, I'm sure it's hard to be traveling around the world all that time but he's serving a cause he really believes in and he's just happy. He's just laughs a lot. It's amazing. All these individuals they're they're You can tell they're outside of their head. Like they're not neurotic. They're not constantly thinking about themselves. And whenever you see that, you're like, I want, I want that too. I, I don't want, <laughs> I'm tired of like journaling about my, my terrible thoughts. I just don't want even to have to think about it anymore. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the things I learned is I described this in the moments in the Valley is people go out into the wilderness and if you're the sort of person who's spent a lot of life, you know, trying to be popular, wanting to be liked and performing for others, out in the wilderness, the rocks don't care. <laughs> so there's nobody left to perform for. And then you, if you get called to do a task, maybe you call to be a community worker in something, maybe you're called, you love a certain company you're starting up and you think it'll really do some good in the world. You're so busy caring about the commitment you've made. You yourself seem much less important. And I've always thought that you can't replace a bad with a, but you can't replace one thing with nothing. You have to replace it with a better thing. And so finding a better love, like something you love more than you love yourself is just the way to do that. Let's talk about the last commitment, which is to community. You mentioned earlier that you think that the rebuilding community is probably the great challenge of my generation. What for you, what does an ideal community look like to you? There was a book by a woman named Jane Jacobs, which was written somewhere around 1962, called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And she lived in Greenwich Village in New York in a little village, little community, little neighborhood there, which was then a middle-class neighborhood. Now it's really rich, but back then it was middle-class. And she was looking out her street, at her street from her second-story window, and she realized that her street was like a ballet, that early in the day, the people picking up the trash would come by, then the people would taking their kids off to school would come by. Then the shopkeepers would open their shops. And it was like all this movement on the block. And there was always something happening. Teenagers hanging out, people heading off to the bars. And she said, all this movement is just like a ballet. We're all sort of moving around each other and keeping an eye on each other. And at one point, she's looking out her window and she sees a guy tugging on a nine-year-old girl, pulling her where, to where she doesn't. the girl clearly does not want to go. And Jane Jacobs wonders, am I watching a kidnapping? And she's about to go down and intervene. 
And then she says, oh, wait. And she sees that the, the fruit vendor has stepped out of his store. The locksmith has come out of his store. Two other people have come out. And she says the guy didn't realize, but he was surrounded. And there were just eyes on the street. We're all watching each other. We're all taking care of each other. And it turned out to be only a dad pulling on his nine-year-old daughter to do something. But that's, to me, what a community is. It's like a, a ballet, a collection of people who are moving together organically and dynamically, but keeping an eye on each other and helping each other out when that has to happen. And I'm afraid what's happened in our society is we don't have a lot of those dense places where people live on a street and really can look at each other. We're locked in the privacy of our own homes. And I don't know about your neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, if you went on to somebody's home unannounced at 8.30 at night and knocked on the door just to hang out, that would be considered an amazing violation of privacy. And so we've put privacy above community and sometimes work above community. And so as a result, the social capital is much lower. And what I admire are people who go out of their way to build community. And sometimes they do it by organizing annual dinners or your book club, or there are a zillion ways of, you know, you can have a whiskey club. And that's a fun way to have community. Community should be fun and not just like a chore. Yeah, I definitely think it's going to be, it's a skill that has to be relearned. Because I think a lot of particularly young people, they don't know how to do this stuff. Here's a pretty great example. My mom, my parents still still in the neighborhood that I grew up in when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, there was a very active mother's association. So there was Christmas parties, Easter parties, 4th of July parades, Halloween parties. And then after all the kids my age graduated and left home, that stuff stopped. And not, it wasn't there for 25 years. And so my mom, so they're all grandmas now. My mom and all her friends in the neighborhood decided, we got to get this going again. So they started the mom's organization again. There's these grandmas and they're teaching these young millennial moms how to organize an Easter party or an Easter parade. And like, they're loving it. And these, these young moms are like, we don't know how to do this. We're so grateful that you're showing us how to do this. That that is great. I've never heard of anything quite like that, but that is fantastic. There are just tricks people can do to build community. A friend, he was in college, he's probably 34 now. And he said, I've got a really good group of friends here in college, I'm terrified I'm going to lose them as we, you know, we drift apart in life. And one of his professors said, well, start a giving circle. All of you put money into a pot every year and every year get, get together for four days and decide where, where you're going to donate that money. And the charity is sort of the pretext to, gather, to get together. But the reality is they are now, I don't know, 13 years out of college and every year they get together and they're walking through life together. And so you got to invent something. There's got to be some technology of convening that will pull you into community. But it's just a question of finding what your best technology is. Does a person need to like have all four commitments in their life to have a meaningful life? Or is it, it can just have one or two, or there's going to be you know one in one part of your life and another part in your other life? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people never get married and they're, they live very fulfilled lives. So I would not say you have to have all four. And then sometimes, sometimes are in different phases. Some people really serve their communities. You know, they, work at the Y or do something later in life. And sometimes, especially if you have small kids, that swallows up your life. So that's a commitment that swallows up a lot of time. But I do think being committed to something all the way through. And a commitment is, to me, the best definition of a commitment is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. Because we all, you know, we all have moments where we're feeling dry. We don't want to go to church or we don't really care about the the mentoring program we're in. But if you build habits around that thing and you just go by the habits, it'll carry you through those moments. So I, I always say Jews love their God, but they keep kosher just in case, just because the, the structure of kosher law sort of pulls them through the moments when, you know, they don't feel the presence of God and they're just going about their way. It's about instilling habits. And you also talk about this in the book, create an environment where it makes those habits are easier to follow through on. So have a community where you can, where you have that social pressure, where it's just the normal thing to do and you're going to do it because you, you're with those group of friends that are doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, and this is sort of the model of Al-Anon or, or anything else, or probably even your book club, like, would you really read the book? But if you got to go talk about it with your friends, then you, well, I'll, I'll show up and read the book. And so with, and that's, I think people who are dealing with addiction find the same thing, that they're really doing it because they, they care about those people. They don't want to let them down and they want to set a good model for the people they're in group with. And we're just such contagious creatures that if 
six people around you gain weight, the odds that you're going to gain weight are extremely high. If they start smoking, you'll probably start smoking. If they stop drinking, you'll probably stop drinking. We're very, we think we're not connected creatures, but we're extremely connected to each other. Right. Plato says we're mimetic animals. Right, exactly. Mimesis, we copy others, right? Well, David, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, they can go to the Amazon webpage to get the book. And then the, the community stuff, I've got an organization at the Aspen Project called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. And they can go to uh, weareweavers.org. And that's there they can learn about some of the most amazing people I've, le- I've met over the last few years who really are building community on the ground level and leading really lives that I would love to copy. Well, David Brooks, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. My guest today was David Brooks. He's the author of the book, The Second Mountain, The Quest for Your Moral Life. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Check out our show notes at aom.is slash second mountain, where you find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.